Hi, welcome to Drilling 101. Today we're going to look at how to sharpen drill bits on pedestal grinders. Uh, general use drill bits or what we call in the trade jobber drills for use in steel. Now before we look at how to physically sharpen a drill bit on a pedestal grinder, it'd be a great idea to take a look at the different parts of a drill so that we can understand how drills function. First thing to be said is that drills are divided into two parts. There's the body of the drill or the working part of the drill and then there's the shank. The shank is the part of the drill that's held in the machine tool that we're using. There are three types of shanks that you will generally find. The first are these tapered shanks. In this case we have an MT4 tapered shank which is a Morris taper number four. These shanks produce a lot of holding power because for a large drill there's going to be a lot of torque. So we find them mostly on drills that are larger than a half inch or 13 millimeters in diameter. The second type of drill, the one that we see most often, is this parallel shank type of drill. For drills 13 millimeters, half inch and smaller, these parallel shanks are generally used to hold drills in drill chucks, either on drill presses or on manual drills. Uh, they are less hard than the rest of the drills so that the drill chuck can bite into it a little easier and increase its holding power. The third type is really a compromise and it's these reduced shank, parallel shank drills. Now, they reduce the shank so that they can fit in regular the drill chucks. Even though the drill itself is a little too large to be used in drill chucks, it is a compromise and they're not to be used uh, very much because obviously a large drill requires a lot of torque and a reduced shank just can't give it to us. So if we're stuck, fine, but we're going to have to go very lightly on the drilling, which isn't a good thing. So it's to be used only when we have no other choice. I'm going to return to my large taper shank drill uh, so we can take a look at the working end or if you prefer the body of the drill. The body of the drill is composed of several parts. First we have the flutes. Alongside the flutes we have the margins. There's two, one for each flute. Then we have what's called the web. The web is the center thickness of the drill. At its extremity, the web becomes a very important part of the drill, the chisel edge. The chisel edge is part of the point of the drill and it serves to push material out of the way because drill bits do not cut on their center. They just push the material out of the way so that that material can be lifted and taken away by the cutting edges. And the cutting edges, there are two of them on the drill they're very sharp and they're used for the cutting action. That's a quick uh, rendition of the different parts on the body of a drill. Uh, I think it would be important to look at each one in a little more detail. So let's start with the flutes. As we said at the start, the flutes are there to give a space for the chips to go into. If the chips had nowhere to go, well the drill just wouldn't cut. But it's a little more complicated than that. There are three basic types of flutes. There's the general flute that we have here, which has a reasonably low helix angle, and that is found on most jogger drills. And these, these flutes permit the drill continuously about three times the diameter of the drill in depth, after which you should start a peck drilling cycle which is to drill, retract, drill, retract, drill, retract, to clear the chips, because the helix angle just isn't enough. Now, that would tend to bring us to the second type of flutes, which are the high helix flutes. Same type of drill, same type of point geometry, it's just that the helix of the drill is a lot steeper, and that permits to extract the chips 
a little deeper into a hole and is very practical for certain materials that produce powdery chips like gray cast iron or bronze. The third type of flutes are the straight flutes. They have no helix angle. They are parallel to the axis of the drill. And those straight flutes give an attack angle on the chip producing surface of the tool that is zero or a neutral attack angle. This is particularly useful in materials that have very high penetration rates such as brass, lead, and copper. In these materials, a helix angle would just jam itself into the material rather than produce the chip that you want. So, high helix angles for deep holes, a normal helix angle for general work, and zero helix angle or straight flute drills for work in pieces that are very soft. That includes most plastics. Okay, the second part we're going to look at are the margins. Now the margins are a sharp edge that run along the flutes. Note that I said sharp edge. I did not say cutting edge. Because the margins are not made to cut. Their reason for being is to stop chips from jamming themselves between the outside diameter of the hole and the drill body itself. The margins improve the quality of the hole or the surface finish of the hole that we're producing. If your margins are worn, it's best just to discard the drill. Uh, if they are worn, there's a good chance that it's because you use the old technique of bending the drill around to enlarge a hole. You should never do that. Drills are not made to cut on their margins. They are not cutting edges. Now, should the margins be worn close to the intersection between the cutting edge and the margin, well, that can simply be resolved during sharpening by just backing the end of the drill off a little bit, and that will remove the worn part of the margin. Now, the third and fourth parts that I want to look at are the web and the chisel edge. The web is the thickness of the drill core from the bottom of one flute to the bottom of the other flute. That thickness is very important because it controls the length of the chisel edge. It's important also to know that the web thickens as we work our way down the drill. The web is a lot thicker at the back end of the drill than it is at the start, which means that as we grind the end of our drill to sharpen it and reduce its length, we are thickening the web. And that creates a longer chisel edge. Now that's important also because the chisel edge is responsible for moving the material away from the center of the drill. The chisel edge does not cut. It pushes material aside so that that material can go get picked up by the cutting edge. We'll go to the blackboard to take a better look at how that action works. Now, if we look at the end of a drill bit and transpose what we see to the blackboard, this should be about what we end up with. A chisel edge that describes about a 45 degree angle and a straight line between the two cutting edges of the drill. And as we see here, this represents about the outside diameter of the drill body. Now, when this drill rotates, it rotates in this direction. Okay, so this is the cutting edge that's lifting a chip that will progress up through the flutes. Now, this rotates about its center. Well, let's say that's the center of the drill, which should also be the center of the chisel edge. Now, if the drill is rotating, regardless of what speed, we know that the center of the drill has a surface speed of zero. It might be turning, but it has no movement in reality. 
which means that at the end of a drill, see as the cutting edge cannot go right to the center, has to move material out of the way. And here's what it looks like. Everything on this side of the center of the chisel edge is going to progressively get moved sideways until it can reach a cutting edge. The same is true for the other side. It will go there, and once it reaches a cutting edge, it can be taken up the flute and pushed away. So this is what the chisel edge is used for. It's to push material towards the cutting edge of the tool. This means that it's very important that this chisel edge be as short as possible, because the wider that it is, the more difficult that it's going to be to push that tool through the part that we're trying to drill. Now, the 45 degree angle is important because that helps it move material towards the cutting edge. And the length is important for the pressure. So try and keep it as straight as possible. If you get an S curve in your chiseled edge, it's going to be very difficult to drill that hole. So as we've seen, the chisel edge does not remove material. And it's important to say that if when you're drilling you feel resistance, in other words the tool does not self-penetrate the work, it's largely due to the chisel edge. The resistance to penetration comes from this edge. If the edge is too wide, then it takes a massive amount of force to feed the drill into the work and the drill will just not function properly. It's important to know too that drills are available in different lengths. Long series drills have thin webs on a longer distance. Stub drills or very short drills also have the reduced web thickness so that even if they're short, the, the thickness or length of the chisel edge is reduced. But if you just cut a jobber drill in half to get a shorter drill, well, it won't work very well because, as we said, the chisel edge will be too long and give you way too much resistance. And the chisel edge does another thing other than just stop the drill from penetrating the work. It controls the feed. For a reasonable force, the thickness or length of the chisel edge should give a certain resistance and control the feed so that the tool does not advance in the work too rapidly. This is very crucial to know if you're going to be pre-drilling holes. If you pre-drill a hole, it is crucial to drill your hole slightly smaller than the length of the chisel edge of the drill that's going to follow. If the hole is larger than the chisel edge of the drill to follow, then the drill that will follow will self-penetrate the part and have a tendency to jam into it. This is going to damage your cutting edges, it's going to damage your margins, and it's not going to give you a proper diameter on your hole. Now, we still have the cutting edges and the relief angles to talk about, but we'll do that as we sharpen the drill point. So let's move on to the pedestal grinder and take a look at how to properly sharpen a jobber drill for use in steel.